than reading books of old. The legends in the myths, Achilles and his gold, Achilles and his gifts, and Spider-Man's control, and Batman with his fist. But I'm not the kind of person that it fits. She said, where you wanna go? How much you wanna risk? I'm not looking for somebody with some superhuman gifts. Some superhero, some fairy tale bliss. Something that I can turn to, something that I can kiss. I want something just like this. Do -do 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 -do. Thank you, Noah. Noah, you were an intern last year, right? Yeah. So Noah was an intern last year. He was a music intern. He just had unbelievable uh, impact here. And that song is really about adventure and really standing into just having defining moments in our life. We're in this series called Defining Moments. And if you walked in the lobby, you saw all those big headshots of all the people, right? And all of them are our interns from this past year. And we celebrated them this past week, and it was awesome to hear them share their hearts. I couldn't be there that night, but I heard all about these stories, and they're sharing their defining moments this past year. And I'll tell you something, the internship program here is unbelievable, and the impact that they've had. Even Noah, even to this day, has impact on our team, and so we're grateful uh, for them. So that's what you see when you walk out there. So don't walk out and just hit your head on those. I noticed that. Like, for me, I just ran right into them, right? But be careful there. So uh, welcome. I'm grateful that you are 
are here. Hey, I want to give this crowd in particular uh, instructions for what's going to happen over the summer. Now, I know some of you, you know, you have your, your name written under your seat, and this is where you sit every week, and this is, you know, and now I'm going to start to mess you up a little bit. So here's what's going to happen. Uh, starting June 30th through August 11th, we are going to be taking Saturdays off, and we're just going to... Did you just groan over there? But uh, see, I told you, there's going to be people here that are not going to be happy with me. But we're going to take six weeks, six Saturdays off. We're calling them sunsets on Saturday. And the reason that we kind of do this is, one, we know that Michigan only has about two and a half months of summer. Right? And so uh, we really do want us to be with our families, be with our neighborhoods. Our attendance does come down in, the, in Michigan summers. We know that. And so we'll have room on Sundays to have everyone here. I'm encouraging you to come back on Sundays. I know some of you, it's hard for you to do, but I encourage you guys to do that uh, on our 9 a.m., noon, any of the service, 1030. We'd love to have you. But well, I wanted to put that on your radar for this. We're going to talk to you every week, and you're going to get really annoyed by it. But you, we know how much you hang on to these Saturdays. So uh, thank you for being patient with that. Well, what we're also going to do today is we are going to look at our annual report and we're going to vote. Last week, Andrew Kim, uh, in fact, speaking of Andrew Kim, they're having a defining moment really close. Andrew's here, but Robin is is just about ready to deliver the baby. So if it doesn't happen this weekend, uh, it's going to happen Tuesday, right? That's the deal. So it's set up for Jesus. You can be praying for them. That's going to be a defining moment. Going from two to three, sorry, but it's really hard. So have fun with that. <laughs> no, it's going to be great. So uh, yeah, but, but we are going to look at our annual report and we're going to vote on it. I'm going to show you a few slides uh, so they understand exactly what we're doing. I know Andrew uh, prepped that last week, but uh, this annual vote is for 1819, the budget and also the elders. So we go through each one of those uh, and then we're going to go through elders. Uh, I was uh, privileged to be nominated this year. I was, it's humbling. It's a year, year-long thing, so you can vote on that, uh, and that is going to be our elder team that you can vote on. And there's, uh, t- if you walked in, you should have gotten a ballot, and so it's really simple. Even if this is your first time here, we'd love you to fill it out uh, and vote. You're allowed to do that, and you can say that. Are you a member of Kensington? You can check that. Uh, and if you, and, and let me say this, if you're a member, the, a member of Kensington, that means you're really invested in this community. This is your home. This is your home church. You've been invested with it. Your family's here. You're on mission. You believe uh, what God is doing here. And what that means many times for us is that we step in. So one thing that I do want to mention about July, as we take Saturdays off, we're still looking this summer for people to step in with our kids program. So if you uh, are moved that way and you're a member here and you're all in, I would encourage you to go online, sign up, talk with us out in the lobby. But I really do want you to look over this. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to do that. You put your name, your address, your email, and then affirm the budget. Uh, and, and if you want, there's a, if anyone didn't get this, they can raise their hand. If you want to look over some of the budget, we have that too. You can bring those down as well if you need those. But just take a couple of minutes, fill those out. If you have questions, write it on the back. And honestly, we are open book here. So if you have any questions at all, we will talk to you. We will walk you through stuff. Uh, really, we are open about all of this. So take a couple of minutes, fill that out, and then we'll collect them when we uh, receive our offering later in the day. Well, thank you. Once again, if you have any questions, I'm going to be here too after service so you can come up and talk, uh, talk to me as well. Well, thank you for that. So one of, if you've been here for a while, you know one of our values is to go. As we show up, we jump in, and then we move out. And we always feel as you look into Scripture, you will see that when, God, when you have an encounter with God and He starts accompanying you on your life, we're going to talk about that today, encounter and accompaniment. You can hold those words if you want. We're going to talk about that. When that happens... 
Many times, as you start walking through your faith journey, as Jamie Winch had talked about last week and I talked about the week before, God is going to prompt you to go. Because each person has people around them that God wants to send his message to. And it's unique to, to you, to, to the people that are in your life. And so there are two special people for me personally and for our Troy campus that have been called to go. And so we're going to take a few minutes to hear their story. Why don't you welcome Caitlin McGuire and Carly DeCrager up on stage. We call Carly CDK. So, uh, well, both Caitlin and Carly have been dear to me. Uh, Caitlin has really been a major impact in our student ministries. This past year, your student ministry director, uh, you've really poured into our uh, middle school program, absolutely flourish. You're awesome at it. And, and I get to see you behind the scenes, and I just think you're an amazing leader. Carly, uh, you, you kind of go unnoticed in that because of the way that you operate, but you've been an abs- just as equally impactful under the surface making this whole thing go. Not only that, but you are our admin for Troy Campus and you're uh, an awesome uh, admin, but you're so much more than that. And so you're an artist, you're, you got all kinds of gifts. And so I think what the Lord has really done is given you both a vision to come into all of your gifts. And so I want you to share uh, what you're being asked to do and then maybe a little bit more of the vision. Yeah, so, um, I, so I've been on staff here for probably, I think, four or five, five or six years, something like that. And I have loved every minute of it. I always joked that before I came to Kensington, I would never work at a church. I was like, I don't want to work at a church anywhere. I just don't want to be a part of it. And I came on staff here and fell in love with it. And hey, so, I that same thing. Yeah. Is there something wrong with us? I think so. Yeah, I think there like is. So. Yeah. So you should yeah. never say you'll never do something because exactly. you're going to end up doing it. But, but it was, it's been crazy. It's been an awesome ride and just kind of learning ministry and what it means to be in ministry and love people and love students. Um, and about a year ago for me, I, I kind of started sensing that something was changing. Uh, I love our middle schoolers, but all of a sudden it was like I had this bigger vision that I didn't realize was there before. And so for me, I just started asking God what that was. It was kind of terrifying because I was, I love my role here and things were going great. And, you know, people were really saying great things about me, but I really felt like God was saying, hey, I have something more. And so I just started praying and asking what that was. And through kind of a random series of events of meeting people and getting connected and talking to Carly about what God was doing in her life, I really realized that God was inviting uh, really the both of us and kind of a team that has been formed to start a new movement uh, and to create a new movement that will reach the next generation. And when I say next generation, I really mean that millennial generation, my generation. And what I realized was is that God was inviting me to start a new church and to be a part of a new kind of thing that was happening. And really the heart behind that is saying, hey, this generation looks at the church and is leaving in rapid numbers. And it's not because we think that the church is irrelevant or that there's anything wrong with it, but we're leaving because we just don't feel like we need it. But the one thing that every probably millennial I think would tell you is that we desire community and we desire to be in relationship. Uh, We're the generation that they say is the most connected of all time, but the most disconnected of all time. And so our heart really is to say, we want to start a church that is there to invite everyone into the outrageous love of God. And we believe that happens through relationships with each other and through community with people who have met God and who know Jesus. And that's how we can invite other people who maybe don't know him into relationship with him. And so I'm excited to announce that at the end of this month, June 30th, uh, we're going to be packing up our house and we're going to be moving to Nashville, Tennessee to launch a brand new church movement where we're going to invite people in to experience the love of God. And the thing is, people say, well, why Nashville, right? Do you really need another church in the Bible Belt, right? The reality is right now, Nashville is actually growing by 90 people a day. So 90 people a day are moving into that city. And what we believe is that's 90 people a day that are lonely and don't have community. And our hope is that we can plant ourselves right in that community and say, hey, if you don't have a community, you don't know anyone, come and be a part of ours. We want you to experience love and connection. And then maybe through that love and connection, you'll meet Jesus in all of that. And I, I love, Carly, what you said. Well, give them a hand for that because we're excited about That's going to be our, 
That's going to be our 60th, uh, our 60th church plant that we're going to be a part of at this place. This is just one of the things that the Lord has really, um, it's a gift that, he's been, that we could be a part of so many church plants. So you're, you're number 60, I think. We have to check with Steve Andrews, but he changes the numbers all the time. So, uh, but Carly, um, I loved what you said out in our, we, we always pray before services, and I love what you said about the kind of person that you're thinking. So the, the two, the, not quite the 2 a.m., but something else. I yeah, so it. one of the things that we have Kaylin, who never wanted to work at church, and I, who hated church, have loved about Kensington, is that Kensington's vision and values are so easy to grab onto and to actually live. And so Kensington really pushes people to be on a serving team or in a small group or just to link arms with someone and to do life together. And so Kensington's vision and values asks, who's your 2 a.m. friend? Who do you call at 2 a.m. when you don't have anybody else, when things are rough? Who's that person? And so as we're wrestling through the language of what the church plants, church startup looks like, um, we have landed on where do you have fridge rights? So whose house can you walk into and grab yourself a cold glass of milk from the fridge without asking? And who can do that in your house? Because those are the people that you're living with. And when you live, when you do life that closely and when you do life that intently with someone, then they can't help but experience Jesus through you. And so they're experiencing Jesus just by watching you live your life and by living their lives so closely with yours. That's awesome. Well, hey, I'm super proud of both of you. You know how much I love you. And we've already gone through emails a number of times and had a number of conversations. And I'm excited about what it's going to do. I'm going to invite uh, Andrew Kim and Sam Frangioni to come up and pray with us and pray over you. And uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll close it out. But hey, guys, come up and let's pray. And, and please invite you all. Let's move up here. I'm going to invite you all to pray with us. Go ahead, Sam, why don't you open this up? Um, Dear Jesus, God, I thank you so much for Caitlin and Carly and for the vision that you've put um, in their hearts, God, for your children, for your people. Father, I thank you for their impact in this place over the last several years. And God, I just pray for uh, that they would just walk in obedience, um, God, as as they make this move. God, and I just pray for your goodness and steadfastness just to be overflowing um, in their circumstances. God, as they move, as they transition, as they meet new people, God, that your favor would follow them where they go. And I had my daughter with me earlier today, God, and I was just thinking about what these two are doing. Jesus, and I just ask, um, God, that the boldness that the two of these women have, God, that that would just uh, encourage and inspire a generation of women. God, as they're as they raised up um, in the years to come, God, but I thank you so much for what you're doing in them and what you're going to continue to do and to reach the community in the Nashville and the 90 people that are moving there every single day. God, we thank you that they've heard what you desire for them to do and they said yes, God. Thank you for the courage to really be able to step out, to catch the vision that you have for them in this season of their life, God. We pray, Lord, that you would provide them with amazing people uh, just on their team as they continue to form their team, God. People who they're able to just really link arms with, God, who they're able to breathe life into and vice versa as well, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you would use this community to communicate who you are to the people there in such an extraordinary, powerful, and personal way. And so we thank you for them. We pray that you would continue to provide for them, that you would protect them as well, Lord. But we thank you so much for them. Lord, I just want to say thank you for the heart that they've poured into this place, the soul, the way they've loved our students, and they've loved them well. And it's been unbelievable, and so I want to thank them for that. Father, I'm so grateful for the conversations that I've been able to have, especially with Caitlin when she breathed this vision out in my office uh, probably two years ago, and just trying to fan that into flame, knowing that you were going to send her to start something. We didn't know what at the time. And so we're so grateful uh, for that. I'm grateful for these two young women. More than women, they are powerful followers of you. And they have your power, they have your authority, they have your love and grace and mercy. And Lord, you're sending them in for people. And so, Father, I ask that you open their eyes to see the people that you have for them. To create the kind of community that you need there. Not that they want, but that you need. And that you, they will step boldly into that and be courageous to follow you. Father, let them encounter people and accompany them all along the way in this new journey. Thank you, Lord. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Give them a big hand. What's that? Hey, um, we're going to talk in a minute about, uh, about this defining moment, but I would love for you, if you want, just to take a minute, stretch out, just uh, say hi to someone next to you, and then we'll jump in.
So I think you need to be praying for me too. I pray for this voice to hold up. I've been sick for three days. Sorry for all the people I shook your hand. You're going to be sick too. Uh, no, I'm, I, I think I'm fine. But boy, the last three days have been rough. So uh, you can pray this voice holds up the next uh, two days. Well, we're grateful uh, to be in this series called Defining Moments, and we really have walked through three defining moments, Andrew, Kim, myself, and then last week got to hear from Cliff Johnson with, our, with, Andrew, or, or with uh, Jamie Winch up here, and it was really a, a powerful weekend last weekend, and each week has had a nugget or a truth in it uh, that we're really looking at in, in these, what has happened in, in our lives and how we find that in scripture and how it defines out in our life as a community. And so today we get to hear from Patrick Holden. Patrick Holden is our lead teacher up at our Traverse City campus. Patrick's amazing. He's a young guy. I think he got here. He's 28 years old, 29, something like that. Super young, dynamic, great leader, humble guy. Boy, I'll tell you something. I'm old enough to be his dad. I would love to have him as my son. He's an amazing guy. I had no idea part of his story that he's going to share. And it is super powerful. And we are really going to talk about, like I've been saying already a couple times, two words, the way I interpret this, two words. These words came from a book I was reading a few weeks ago. The, the only two words I took out of this whole book. I read the whole book and I was like, I was all right. But these two words stuck out to me. They were two words quoted by Pope Francis. And the two words were encounter and accompaniment. Encounter and accompaniment. And he was talking about how we need to encounter people and then we need to accompany them in their life. And he used Jesus as an example. It's really powerful, powerful teaching. And so I want to use those two words as we look at Patrick's story because as we encounter people, we never know the situations that they're in. But God's always going to send, like Caitlin and Carly are going to people. God's always going to send his people to other people. And so all of you are part of that mission. If you're saying, hey, I'm following Jesus, you're part of that mission. And when you go there, you go and you take his love and his mercy and his grace and his power and his authority to transform this world for him, not for us. And so when we look at that, there's always going to be people in your midst. And we get the absolute privilege to show God's love to our neighbors. And so that's what we're going to look at today, our neighbors. In fact, when I started thinking about loving our neighbors, which we're going to look at that scripture, I can't help but think of a story when I was a kid because we used to have paper routes. Did anyone else have paper routes in here? A lot of you. That means you're really old. So, we, you know, that went away a long time ago. Sorry. But my parents made us have a paper route. And all three of our brothers, my, I have two other brothers, older one and younger one, we all inherited the paper route. And I was a musician. I didn't want to work. So I'm like, I don't want the paper route. You have to work, right? And so I got the paper route. But I'll never forget something that happened with my brother, Joe. He's my older brother. He actually experienced what we're going to talk about today in a profound way as a kid. We had a neighbor called Mr. Walensky. I'll never forget him. Real old guy. And he would, uh, when you knocked on his door to collect, he had sort of like a Tourette syndrome kind of thing. And it wasn't like a swear, but it was just a sound. And he was just, hoo, 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 hoo. And then as he walked faster, it would get faster. Like, hoo, 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 hoo. And we thought as kids, this is awesome. Like this, we thought it was really funny. And you open up the door, we collect our money, we sort of talk to him, and we leave. He was pretty lonely. So my brother said to my mom one Christmas, hey, I'd like to get a gift for Mr. Walensky. So he shows up, he, he knocks on the door. I mean, I'm kidding. It would take Mr. Walensky like two minutes to get to the door. And he would have this like, you know, chorus happening. And he'd get there and he opened up the door that day. And my brother says, hey... Uh, I'm collecting, he collects money. He says, hey, I got something for you for Christmas. He gave him a gift. And this guy broke down and just wept. Just cried. He couldn't believe because no one had thought about him that Christmas. Not one person. He had no one. And my brother, what, what happened? He was sent to that door. As a little kid, I got something for you. That's what God does to his children. He sends his children out, and we get to share his love and his faith. So Mother Teresa says a great quote. I'm going to use her in the beginning. I'm going to use her at the end as well. I'm going to share part of her, her, her Nobel Peace Prize speech that I find so moving. But she says this, we can do no great things, only small things with great love. That was that little gift from that brother gave to Mr. Walensky. We, we, don't do, we don't do any great things. God's the only one that does the great things. But we can do these small things with great love. The great commandment calls us to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And that's really where we're going to look at today. And so we're going to start with a song called Ring the Bells. It's actually written and performed by, uh, you know, obviously no one's going to lead us today, but it's written and performed by 
Drew Holcomb, who is Steve Andrews' nephew, is a great songwriter. His wife, Ellie, is a great songwriter. They're really nationally known. They're really, really great. And this song speaks to the idea of, I don't want your fake Jesus. I want Jesus' real love. And so ring the bells. I want this, not this. And we're going to have that thought, and then we're going to go into Patrick Holden's story. Fall into this, and let's see what God does. Ring the bells, it's time I mean it Bid the hatred fairly well Give back the pieces of my Jesus Take your counterfeits to hell Bang the drums, this means war Not the kind you waited for We say mercy won't be rational here It's what we're fighting for Tell me what is love and even for so long behind these statues in these steeples does that hit too close to home well, i got faith to move a mountain and to watch that mountain move it's time for words to fall like thunder the sound of justice breaking through My defining moment was Christmas 1999. Uh, now to understand some of my story, you kind of have to go back to the beginning. I, uh, I grew up in a single parent home. Uh, it was always just me and my mom growing up and we were always very close. She was wanting to be a stay at home mom and uh, she wanted to be around me, but she also wanted to have a successful business and be able to provide for our family. And so what she did is she created her own business where we would travel all over the country and teach people how to play piano. And so if you can imagine this, we have this big, you know, RV kind of motorhome thing, and we would pack a hundred like small Casio, like Toys R Us type pianos in the bottom of it. And we'd go all over the country and she would set up and for a couple hundred people, she would teach them how to play piano. And at the same time, as we were doing this whole business thing, uh, she found time to be involved in all the things that I cared about as well. And so I remember she got me this little like wiffle ball bat and, uh, and she got me a little wiffle ball and so I'd go outside and just throw it up and, and hit it on my own. And I'll never forget the day, uh, I was, you know, I was pretty young. She came out and she came out in a big baseball jersey. And if you can imagine this, the 80s, like big poofy curly hair, walked out with that and a fitted hat on top of it. And uh, she came out and she was gonna pitch to me so that, you know, I could learn how to hit. Um, but by the time I got to middle school, um, she had been feeling uh, not well. She hadn't been feeling well. And, uh, you know, she had kind of chalked it up to, 
you know, maybe, you know, it was the flu or she just wasn't, you know, she wasn't doing well. And I remember she dropped me off at school one day and I was there throughout the day. And, uh, and about midway through, right around lunchtime, I get a call that said, Hey, uh, you're going to get picked up early from school. And I remember going down to the office. I had my <clears throat> big book bag on and, uh, I saw her there and it looked like she had, she was pretty upset. And so we got in the car and we drove probably two blocks after that. And in the car, it was just silent. She hadn't said really anything and I didn't really talk much. And uh, we got to a red light and there was nobody around. And at that point, she just, she just breaks down and she starts crying. And she said, Patrick, uh, I was just diagnosed with cancer today. And she kept talking from that moment uh, on. But I mean, you know this, if you've ever had news like that, um, you don't really hear anything after the word cancer. Like there was nothing else that really popped up for me. Uh, I just remember a, an overwhelming amount of emotion uh, that flooded me all at the same time. Uh, as a kid growing up, you know, in a single parent home, I would have men say, you know, you're the, you're the man of the house. Like you need to, you know, you take care of your mom. In some ways, I feel like I was stone faced, kind of receiving everything that she was saying. And, and feeling like I wanted to let it all out, but that I couldn't. And so trying to be like whatever this man of the house thing is, I remember leaning over and giving her a hug. And, uh, and when I gave her a hug for the first time uh, that I could ever remember, feeling like I was lying to my mom, saying it's all going to be okay. And what happened over the next couple of days really feels like a whirlwind. Um, we found or we found out that day, and then two days later, uh, she was in surgery. And so, uh, so they they did the surgery. I stayed at a friend's house, um, and the surgery went really, really great. Everything was successful with the surgery, but there was a long recovery period that was coming up next. Because she had been so successful in her business, we lived in a large home. You know, we, we had a lot of things. I had, you know, the basketball goal that I always wanted. I had all, I mean, I had everything that I could have ever wanted. And within about a six month period, uh, because of some of the bills that we had, we lost really everything that we had. And we got to the place where we found out that we were going to lose our home. At the time where we didn't know what we were going to do, uh, we didn't have family around. It was just me and her. <clears throat> Somebody from our church reached out. And they said, hey, we've got this really small apartment. Uh, and uh, if you guys want to live in it for the next, you know, six months or nine months until you get back on your feet, you certainly can do that. We went over to this apartment and uh, we unloaded everything. My mom was still really weak through this recovery process and still not feeling, you know, uh, up to speed. And we got everything in the apartment. And, uh, and then for the next several months after that, I think we just kind of, we were just kind of, living. It felt like one big blur. Our lives were extraordinarily different. My mom was still recovering and struggling through like how to navigate that. Uh, she wasn't working at the time. And, uh, you know, we'd been living in some ways off of our savings during this point. Uh, I'd go to school and then come back. And when I came back, the rest of my evening was uh, in some ways trying to take care of trying to take care of her and, and do that. So towards the end of this year, we were coming up on Christmas time and growing up, Christmas was always a really big deal at our house. My mom would, uh, she would decorate the whole house. I mean, she would have the most amazing trees. She'd be up on a ladder, you know, nailing lights in and, you know, doing the whole thing. And it was always a big deal for us. But coming up on this Christmas, I mean, obviously we were going to experience something that was very different. So early December, we were at our house and it was around dinner time that night and there's a knock at the door. And as soon as I opened the door, uh, there were these five women that were standing there and they just started like screaming and Merry Christmas and all of that sort of thing. They had on Santa hats and the ugliest Christmas sweaters that I think you could ever imagine. And uh, they were all carrying these presents and lights and decorations. And in that moment, it hit me. They, they were here to decorate our house. They were here to, to give us gifts. They were here to make Christmas happen. Uh, in some ways for us. After we open the door and we see these women standing there, turning around and seeing my mom behind me. And what she was feeling in that moment was just this overwhelming joy and thankfulness. And it was something that I hadn't seen in her in a very long time. And it was something that I had been praying for and that I had been hoping for and hoping that God would allow us to experience, you know, during Christmas that year. But the crazy thing, it wasn't that it happened in this miraculous way. It wasn't happening in the ways that I expected. That joy that was happening in that moment was made possible because of these five women in my mom's small group who showed up on our behalf to give us something that we could have never given ourselves. I'll never forget opening the door and seeing Rose and seeing Michelle and seeing Karen all standing there. And I don't think they had any idea 
just how much they were giving us, but it was in that moment that we felt so extraordinarily loved and reminded that we weren't alone and that God was with us. And ultimately, they gave us a gift that we could have never given ourselves. a ah, powerful story. Um, <clears throat> I had no idea about that, you know, and you see, you always see, when you hear people's story, it's one of the most important things, by the way, it's a side note, but one of the most important things we do as human beings is to hear each other's story. <laughs> because whenever you hear someone's story, all of a sudden you have more compassion, you start to see more of their life, you start to draw closer. It's a really important story, it's very important. So I had no idea about this, and it just drew me into Patrick and his family in a different way. That's why the Bible is a narrative. That's why it's a story. That's why many times we talk in narrative and story because our stories are important. What God is doing it through us is important. And here's this boy, this young man, this middle schooler, right? Caitlin spent a lot of time in Carly with middle schoolers. We know middle schoolers. They're squirrely, but man, uh, they're go that's a hard age, you know? And here he is, and he's praying. He's like, man, I need, I need a moment, you know? I want to see, see my mom have this moment. And it, where does it come? It comes through people that notice. Uh, it comes through God's people that he sends into a moment <laughs> to what? To love. And to create this unbelievable mercy and love in this moment. And so many times we forget simple things like that as Father Jesus. That as we follow him, those, those four or five women were the church in that moment. We're not talking about a building. We're talking about God's church, his people. And God sends his people to bring his love, to express his kingdom in a different way. And life's changed. This is Patrick's defining moment. We said, well, what is your defining moment? This is his defining moment. Guess what? Patrick is leading communities for Christ now. I don't know if that had something to do with it, but I would think maybe it does. I didn't ask him that. But maybe he caught that vision of saying, this is what it means to follow Jesus. Yes. God calls us into situations, into people. And many times, I've noticed this with my own self. I'll get, as I started following Jesus, I started diving into Scripture, and I started analyzing Scripture, I started to start to look at it more legalistically. I started looking at, at the Bible as just rules, a way that I'm supposed to live. This is just rules, and I have to stay within these lines. In fact, a lot of my upbringing, it's exactly what it was. It was a set of rules, and so I started looking at God as a set of rules. And God, in, the, in a, an amazing story we're going to talk about in a minute, it's one that I've taught here before, but I come back to it each time, and God tries to push away that for a moment and say, no, there's something that is way more important than, these, than this law. And so we're going to look at that. And we're going to look through the, the lens, like I said, of two words, encounter and accompaniment. Encounter is a beautiful word because when you look it up by definition, you, when you have an encounter, many times it's unexpected. And that's what I've noticed in my faith walk. Many times the encounters that I have are unexpected. In fact, one of them says that you come face to face. That's how they defined encounter. You come face to face. You know that moment when you turn and you're like, you know, those moments that take you by surprise. And then accompaniment is a beautiful word. Because it means that you're coming alongside someone. In fact, I think of it in a musical term. When you're in it, because I think it has more depth. When you're accompanying, when you're accompanying somebody in music, you're actually serving them. You're saying, I'm with you, and I'm supporting you, and I'm serving you, and I'm going to do everything I can. That's what I loved about music, and I loved playing drums for, for a long time with, with some amazing artists. What I loved about it was I was serving them, and I wanted them to succeed. <laughs> so I love how Pope Francis uses those two words. You, you're going to have encounters, and then God's going to say, I want you to accompany. I want you to come alongside, and I want you to walk. Now, I don't know how long that's going to be. Many times we start to think rules right there. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean I have to come here for a lifetime? I can't do that. What does that mean? Do I have to be with him for five minutes, ten minutes? Tell me what I need to do. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how long it is. But God's going to send you to people, and he's going to have a time where you can come alongside and show his love. And so we're going to look at it through that lens. And we're going to look at it through one of my very favorite passages in Scripture. It's one that I use many times uh, when I'm navigating difficult situations. In fact... Uh, when I'm navigating situations that people feel like they haven't been seen or heard, that they've been hurt by the church, they've been hurt by how... Because here's, here's the reality. Most people don't run away from Jesus. <laughs> Most people run away from the people that represent Jesus because they've been hurtful in the way that they've loved 
or not loved. And so Jesus is trying to redefine this for us in this story. And I use this passage when I talk to many people that have been hurt by the church. And it's the Good Samaritan story. It's found in Luke 10. And there's so much in this story. But I want to just focus on a few elements of it. Listen to this story. Then a lawyer who was an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Now sometimes lawyers get a bad rap. We're not going to give lawyers a bad rap. But this lawyer has a case that he's building already. Is he's running to test Jesus. And by the way, this story comes right after Jesus empowers 72, his, his disciples 72, and sends them out to love and heal people. They come back and they're elated. You're never going to believe what happened, God. Yes, I already know what happened. I knew before you left. It was amazing. You empowered us and we went out and we served people and we saw transformation and we saw healing and we saw love come alive and we saw your kingdom. And he's like, yes, I know. And right after that happens, this story happens. A lawyer stands up and he wants to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do? Remember, I do to inherit eternal life. That's a pretty simple question. What, 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 what do I have to do in my life so that I am taken care of in eternity? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? I've said this many times, but I, what I love about Jesus is he asks questions and he tells stories. So this is a great moment. He didn't tell him the answer. Many times in our settings, like, just give me the answer. One, two, three. Jesus rarely does that. He's like, he asks him a question, and he knows that the lawyer knows the answer. Why? Because he's an expert in this law, these 613 laws that have been put, and many of them which were put so that there was these laws that would hold people to a certain standard. So he says, what do you think? And he answers, he says, you should love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus says to him, you've given the right answer. Do this, you're good. Isn't that great? He's like, you win. That's it. Now many times in a Christian life, this is the ultimate question we ask ourselves. It's like, what do I have to do to be secure? What do I have to do to gain eternal life? And as long as that's taken care of, many of us stop there. Like, I'm good. I got my pass. I'm going to make it. And we'll stop. But in classic form, this lawyer is building a case against Jesus. He's going to play this out further. Now, by the way, like I said, lawyers can get a bad rap. My sister-in-law is an attorney. She's awesome. She's super smart. Many of my friends are attorneys. And many of them, when I speak here, you know what they do? They analyze every word I say. It's like, I noticed that you changed that one word. It's like, What? It's like, yeah, and they'll notice nuances. If I change things for a reason, they'll come and meet me and they'll say, hey, I noticed last week you said this, but this week you didn't say that. You know, I'm like, wow, they're bright. They really are super bright because the words matter. And they're building cases. And this lawyer has a case and he's building Jesus. He wants to catch him in sort of this false doctrine. And so he's leading him. But wanting to justify himself, we always get in trouble when we want to justify ourselves in front of God. He asked Jesus, then who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied with an answer? No. He replied with a story. What is wrong with this guy? He just breaks into story. Can you imagine that if your kids ask you something, you're like, let me tell you a story. Maybe you do that. I don't know. But that would not go over well in my home. But this is Jesus in this moment. What does he say? A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And so likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, which is probably like two days' wage, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And then he said this, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever you have spent. Now, here's what I want to ask you. Many of you have heard this story. And one of the most important things to do when we read scripture, and especially these parables, is to say, who are you in this story? Who do you lean towards in this story? I'm going to be honest with you. When I hear this story, who do I relate to? 
When I hear these kind of stories, I'm always the hero. I am. I'm sorry. I'm like super indulgent and very narcissistic. I think I'm going to be the hero. And I put myself, I would, I would never walk by. I would step in. I would do this. I would never do that. Last week, I, you know, Amy and I have been married uh, 26 years. And, or no, 23 years, but together 26 years. And I thought she knew every story about me. Because I've basically told her, I'm like an open book. And so the other, I think it was last week or the week before, I started telling her a story about when I was playing music in this club down in Detroit. And I was saying, yeah, well, it's like that guy, it's like that time when I played down in Detroit and that guy got shot and fell out of his car right in front of me. She was like, what? What is that? You've never told me that story. I was like, oh, well, let me tell you, it was really wild. So we get done playing, and I tear it on all my gear, and I load it up. It's probably 2 in the morning. I go out in front of this club. I, I load up my van. I was a young guy. I was probably in my 20s. And just as I'm loading up, you hear pow, 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 and we all hit the deck. And, it was, and, and then all of a sudden, there's a car, like for me to that exit sign, and it just slowly goes like this, and a guy falls out. And she's like, wow, what did you do? And I said, I just kept loading and I went home. (laughs) Literally, that's what I did. I hadn't thought about that in 20 years or 25 years. I've never thought about this story. Who am I? Like, I had no clue. I hadn't thought about this story. She's like, are you kidding me? That's what you did? I was like, yeah, we all did. We just got in our car and left. Think about that. I would never do that now. Not in a million years. I really don't think I would. But I had no clue. I had no eyes. I thought, that's not my problem. So I thought, that's not me. I don't need to love that person. It's not my problem. Isn't that amazing? What is Jesus saying here? It's powerful. He's challenging the culture. He's challenging the thinking of the day. And what's amazing about this story to me is he's elevating the enemy of the day. The Samaritan was the enemy of the Jewish culture. And so he's elevating the Samaritan. Who's the one that helped? Oh, the one that you actually don't like. The one that's the enemy. The Samaritan comes in and saves the day. He is challenging everything in this story. Culture, thought patterns, the way the law works. All of their worldview is being challenged in this story. That's why I find it so powerful. And so he gets done with this story and he looks at the expert of the law. One of my favorite parts. And he says with this, he asks another question. Which of these three, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, which of those three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? And he said this, he said, the one who showed mercy. And then Jesus said, well, go, do likewise. You know what's amazing at the end of there? I don't know if you caught it. But that question he asked him is a trick question. Because you know who actually technically did right in that story? The priest and the Levite. They were right. Because according to the law, if you go back and read the law, a priest was not allowed to get next to anything like a dead body. Because if he got close to the dead body, he would become unclean. And then he would have to go to the temple and go through rituals and be publicly embarrassed and he would be deemed unclean and dirty. And so you weren't allowed to do that. Even the high priest, I don't think the high priest could even go near his father. I mean, these are really intense rules. And the Levite was probably working with the priest or connected to him. So he's abiding by the law. And so he goes to the lawyer and he says, what's the right answer? Who did the right thing? The lawyer's caught. He thought he was going (laughs) to bring Jesus into the snare. Now he's caught. Now he has to answer. Out of what? Out of his heart. He has to answer about what is the truly the right thing to do. Follow the letter of the law or show unbelievable grace and mercy even to someone that he may not know, love, or care about. And what does he say? It's like, well, the one who showed mercy. That's the one that did right. Isn't that amazing? It's an incredible, incredible story. So how can we learn from the Samaritan How can we learn from what is in the scripture? It's really beautiful what happens because you see encounter and you see accompaniment. You see them happening. Listen to what it says in scripture. It says the Samaritan was traveling and what was the first thing he said? He came near. 
Do you realize, I can't do anything with that guy that I saw harmed in Detroit unless I go near. And many times we don't want to come near. I didn't want to come near. I went home. The first thing he says, oh, he came near. He moved near. And then what? He saw. He came close and he saw. And he saw a need. He saw something that needed to happen. It's beautiful what happened. What's happening right here is now he's encountered. Now he's face to face. Now he's seen and he's come near and now he's made to make a decision. Am I gonna accompany? Am I gonna draw up and am I gonna let myself get dirty? <laughs> am I gonna take a risk? You don't know what's happening in this situation. He's risking and it's powerful. And what does he do? He came near and he saw him and then he was what? Moved. He was moved. Again, when you hear a story like Patrick's, this is what, you see it a different way and you're moved. And what do you do? You move closer. That's how it works. And so he's moved and then what does he do? Out of feeling compassion, that word pity could mean compassion. Out of being moved in compa- and being moved compassionate, what does he do? He does something. That's how God operates. He's going to move your heart. He's going to push you close. He's going to give you an encounter. And then he is going to have you accompany and bring him alongside with you. I'm talking to the people in the room that are followers of Jesus. This is what you're being asked to do. Some of you in the room, I've been wounded by followers of Jesus because they haven't accompanied you. They said, ah, get it together. I'll come back when you're ready. And God's like, no, get dirty. Get close. And so he went and he showed (coughs) unbelievable mercy. You're not praying enough for this voice. (coughs) I told you it was going to be a run. Pray harder. That's the law, right? If we pray harder, God will actually deliver it. That's the truth. And then he showed radical mercy. I love one of my professors, his name was Tim Dearborn. He said, if you look at the Hebrew word for merciful, if you play it down deep enough, it actually means womb. And if you play that out, you think about that story with Patrick. In that moment when they showed up, you know what happened? There was an unbelievable womb that came around. What's a womb? Think about that. A womb, I mean, I think about Robin right now holding that baby in her womb. What has happened over those months with Robin and the baby in the womb? You know what's happened? There's been life. There's been this protection. There's been nutrients. There's been this, what is happening is it's a safe environment. The minute that those showed up at the door, guess what we get to do as fathers of Jesus? We need to create an environment for growth. We need to create an environment that's safe. We need to bring his mercy because we follow a merciful God. Isn't that a beautiful picture? That's what we're called to do. And it's amazing to me when you look at the last words, some of the last words that Jesus said to his disciples. He started to make it clear that there's going to be a day of judgment that comes to say, did you do this? (laughs) Now, I'm not putting uh, any kind of weight around you. I'm just saying this is what Jesus said to his followers. He says, will you encounter and will you accompany? Will you do that? Will you be the ones that, that, that enter into the kingdom? And he says, and, 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 are, and how are you going to do it? And people are probably thinking, are you going to do it by your abilities, your wealth, your popularity, your success? No, shocking. He says, very different. He says it to, this, to his disciples. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And all of his disciples looked at him and said this. All the righteous ones answered and said, Lord, when do we see you hungry, feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? And then the king replied, this is so good. It says, truly, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. God pleads for us as a church to encounter and accompany, to see a need and to meet it. Not for our own glory. There's a lot of good happening. He's saying, no, not for your glory. I'm going to give you situations. Every single one of you have them. 
You can reach people I can never reach. And God's like, I'm going to give you an encounter and I'm going to and I want you to come to me. And bring mercy, bring love, meet a need. Be a, what did you call it? A, a refrigerator friend or something, a fridge friend? You know, be a place where people can go and open up the fridge and get what they want. Be that. I want to read from Mother Teresa's Nobel Peace Prize speech. She talked about this, and it's, it's very moving to me. Uh, it was years ago. I've watched it a number of times, and I watched it again today. I'm just going to read her words. It's a little, it can be jagged at times, but it's, it's absolutely perfect. It says this, And to make sure that we understand what Jesus means, she's talking about this passage. He said that at the hour of death, we are going to be judged on what we have been to the poor, the hungry, the naked, the homeless. And Jesus makes himself that one. He makes himself that hungry one, that naked one, that homeless one. Not only hungry for bread, but hungry for love. Not only naked for a piece of cloth, but naked for human dignity. Not only homelessness for a room to live, but homeless for being forgotten, being unloved, uncared, being nobody to nobody. Having forgotten what is human love, what is human touch, what is to be loved by someone. And Jesus says, whatever you did to the least of these, you do it to me. And this is what I bring before you. She's still talking. To love one another until it hurts. Whoa, I love that. She's like, this is what I bring before you. This is what I say to you today. I bring this before you. Love until it hurts. But don't forget that there are many children, many children, many men and women who haven't got what you have. And remember to love them until it hurts. And then she tells a story. One evening, a gentleman came to our house and said, there is a Hindu family, and the eight children have not eaten for a long time. Do something for them. So I took rice, and I immediately went. And there was this mother and those little ones' faces, shining eyes from sheer hunger. She took the rice from my hand. She divided it into two, and then she left and went out. When she came back, I asked her, where did you go? What did you do? And one answer she gave me, they are hungry also. She knew that the next door neighbor, a Muslim family, was hungry. She said, Mother Teresa said, what surprised me most, not that she gave the rice away, but what surprised me most is that in her suffering, this woman, and in her hungry for her family, she knew that somebody else was hungry, and she had the courage to share, to share that love. Powerful story, isn't it? God is pleading with us to encounter and accompany people. This isn't a shaming thing on any level. This is the privilege that we have as followers of Jesus in this room. This is what the church was designed to be. I'm going to take you to, first, or I'm going to, take you to uh, Matthew 22. We're going to beat up on the lawyers one more time. <laughs> Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together, and one of them, again, an expert in the law, Jesus talked to a lot of experts, tested him with this question. Jesus, teacher, he said, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hinge on these two things. The one factor that transcends everything we do as followers of Christ is how we love how we love God, how we love others. It's the one thing that transcends everything. And that's my hope for this community, that we are known as a community that encounter people and then accompany people in their life and show the extraordinary love of Christ. So here's my questions for you today. What does God, or who does God want to know, you to notice in your life? Who is the person? You could be at work, and every day you go by, I had a conversation with somebody like this. Every day they walk by the same God, the same guy on the street, for months or years on end, and they never saw him. They just walked to work, and they saw the same guy. And finally, God just gave him eyes and said, why do you pass this guy by? Who is that person? When he talked to him, they ended up striking a friendship. This guy's homeless. He sits there every day. They, now they have a friendship, and they've worked through things. Who's in your life that God wants you to notice? And what does he want you to do for them? What does he want you to do? He always has something that you can give. 
And then here's my last one for parents in the room. We're heading into spring, or spring, (laughs) it feels like spring. We're heading into summer. And with your children, I would ask you this. Get with them and see if you can actually teach them by doing something this summer about encounter and accompaniment. And here's what I would say to you. Maybe start the conversation by asking them. Do you know someone in your life that has a need? Because you know what I found? Children are a lot more insightful than we are. Many times they'll say, I know right away. I know someone that needs something. Little ones will say, I know. But I would encourage you this summer. Who do you have that God has put you in line with? Who can you be encountered and what can you do to accompany them? So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to, to end tonight by praying and Jalen and the band are going to come out they've actually written a song it's a fun song actually and uh, so they just wrote it this past week Jalen's going to teach it to you about moving out and doing what God is asking but as I read through that thing with Mother Teresa she read a prayer by St. Francis it's actually really probably not St. Francis you know but he got accredited with a lot of stuff but she had everyone read this in this Nobel Peace Prize speech and so I'm going to ask you to stand if you can If you're able, and I'm going to ask you that we read this together and think about these words as we ask God, God, would you ignite in us an ability to do these things? Let's read it together. You can bring it up. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace, that where there is hatred, I may bring love. That where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness. That where there is discord, I may bring harmony. That where there is error, I may bring truth. That where there is doubt, I may bring faith. And that where there is despair, I may bring hope. That where there are shadows, I may bring light. And where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord, grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is about self-forgetting that one finds. It is by forgiving that one is forgiven. It is about dying that one awakens to eternal life. Amen. Lord, give us eyes to see. Give us a heart. I love that idea of the Samaritan drawing near, seeing, having their heart of compassion, and then doing. Father, would you give us that vision as a community? And as we do that, Lord, we know that we will encounter you as you are with us, accompanying us in this. Give us strength, Lord, to be that kind of a community. We pray this in Jesus' name. As we, as we, as Jalen's going to uh, lead you through this, we're going to receive our offering too. So if you come prepared to give, awesome. Uh, if, if not, I totally, if you're brand new and you're here, this doesn't have to be your moment. If you want to be part of this moment, great. Uh, and then also, if you have your ballots, you can just put them right in the offering pouch. But let Jalen walk you through this song. So I want to teach you all uh, the chorus of this song. This song that Michael King, our music director, and myself wrote this week, actually, after talking to Danny about where he was going uh, in his message. So uh, I'm going to teach you all this chorus, so let's just sing this together. It's simple. It goes, wherever you lead me, wherever you lead me, Lord, to the broken and the hurting, with loving eyes wide open, wherever you lead me. Wherever you lead me, wherever you lead me, Lord, to the hurting and the broken, with loving arms wide open, wherever you lead me. found in you let freedom ring we're no longer bound you've opened up our eyes to see in you we have the victory we're a living 
sacrifice Let's be pleasing in your sight Wherever you lead Father, we do want to be a community that lets you lead us. We want to be able to be led. I love that Caitlin and Carly are here this weekend, that we hear, we encounter you, you push us out, and we go. 
And Lord, we know that the minute their feet hit the ground in Nashville, there's going to be encounter after encounter after encounter an opportunity to come alongside. We thank you for that, Lord. Father, would you increase that in this community? Would you give us a vision of how that can happen more and more, that we draw near, that we draw close, that we have compassion, and that we act? Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this community already. We're so grateful for it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, we'd love to see you Wednesday night. We're going to be talking about uh, greatest of all time, Hebrews 11. We're going to talk about the heroes of the faith. I'm actually going to talk about one of the greatest heroes. I bet you've heard of him before. His name was Barack. It's not Barack Obama. This is a different Barack. And so come back for that. We'd love to he- see you here at 7 o'clock. Uh, remember Saturday. Sorry. But Saturday's June 30th, so be reminded of that. And out, when you go outside, one way that we can act is actually through prayer. So when you walk out, we're doing a whole prayer for this next five, four or five months. This is a great thing to do with your kids, actually. As a family, pray your neighborhoods. We've got a number of neighborhoods on the wall, about seven of them. We'd love to, if you need information, just grab someone out there and then we'll see you out in the lobby. Thanks. Have a great, great week.